One of the questions that I most frequently get is actually a two-part question. And it is, what was it like replacing a founder CEO? And the second part was, why sales loft? And so the first part of that question really comes down to culture and vision. And, and I have been very fortunate, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but I've been very fortunate to build a really fun career in sales. But the answer to the second question, why sales loft, is what I really want to talk about here today. My introduction to this company actually started as a customer. And one of the things that I found when using this technology, we were scaling a large sales organization. We were doing it in the middle of COVID. And one of the things that I realized when I saw the power of Sales Loft was that we are at an incredible inflection point in B2B sales. And, and it's one that I have not experienced in my couple of decades of doing this since cloud computing first came out in the early 2000s. I think we're, we're at that big of a revolutionary moment in what we do. And so when this opportunity came up, I jumped at it um, to come here. Now, when we think about the last few decades, we've been afforded this opportunity um, to take advantage of some big trends. We saw cloud computing, we saw the consumerization of IT, which came apart with mobile, and now we are experiencing both the acceleration and the accessibility of AI. But over the last couple of decades, I've really been fortunate to serve time in almost every role in both pre-sales and post-sales. Started as an SDR, I've been an AE, I've been a frontline manager, I stepped out of sales for a year and hired 400 sellers, which was a fascinating experience. I've done deployments in post-sales. I've had the opportunity to do them all. And it was, didn't feel hard at the time, it just was what it was. But now when we look at the technology that we have available to us, you realize that there's just a far better way to do this. And, and what we see today is we see this radical change happening in a way that is going to change how go-to-market orgs are aligned, how customer organizations are aligned. One of the dynamics we are starting to see is the rise of revenue ops leaders in an organization. And in many companies, we're now starting to see RevOps leaders be a partner to the CRO. And this really reflects this moment that we are in where the art of science and science and art are coming together to transform sales. For many, many years, we built these great sales organizations, primarily based on art because we didn't have tech available to us to drive the science of how we execute every day. We do now. So not only are we going to see orgs fundamentally change in how they are aligned, but we are going to see a totally different paradigm for how buyers and sellers engage. And we're going to talk about why that is. But there are trends that have been happening for the last few years that force sellers to behave differently because buyers are not where they used to be. Now, the other area around this is in every sales org I've ever been part of or seen, you always have the top 10% outperform everybody else, regardless of the macro. It doesn't matter how good or bad the markets are, the top 10% of your sales orgs are always outperforming. Then you have a big cohort in the middle, 70 to 90%, and then you have sort of the long tail. We can fundamentally change this paradigm now. Now, so let's talk a little bit about what's driving this revolution. And the fact that we are all in this room, this room, if you look around, this is the collection of first movers in our space. And first movers are gonna have a disproportionate advantage to those that are not moving in this revolution that we're all experiencing today. The first thing, and you saw some stats on the board, and we're gonna go through this, and you will see it in action when Ellie and Frank get up here. But the first is you're gonna see a big increase in productivity. Now, this does not mean an increase in activity. It actually means an optimization of activity, but it means a real increase that you can measure in the productivity of your go-to-market team, not just your sellers. Everybody whose daily remit is engaging with prospects and customers. You will, you will also see an increase in market share. First movers right now, just like we saw with the cloud, 
just like we saw when applications moved to mobile and others did not, those that take advantage of these revenue orchestration platforms will, by definition, take market share from those that do not. And the third is ultimately, we are going to be able to see a material increase in the long-term value realization with our customers. When we can actually align the buyer journey and the seller journey together, we can establish trust faster with our prospects, we can align on what's most important, and we can drive time to value at a much faster pace. And when we do that, we all will retain and grow our customers far faster than our competition. So let's talk about a little bit of the dynamics that are happening to all of us today that we can actually use to our advantage and to the detriment of our competition. So this first one is 60%. So what this stat reflects, and this is a scary stat for those that do not invest in revenue orchestration. Because what analysts tell us today is that our buyers are doing 60% of their due diligence before they ever pick up the phone and call us. We call any of us. Buyers are not engaging with sellers at all until they've done at least 60% of their due diligence. So if, as a selling organization, you can't meet buyers where they're at, you are likely to be second, third, or last to the party. That's a very, very scary stat. Now, for some of us in the room, we had the opportunity to sit with Seth Mars earlier today. Seth is the lead analyst at Forrester that covers the space. And what Seth guided everyone towards in the conversation today is there are four things that really matter right now. If you are going to invest and embark on revenue orchestration as a bookend to your CRM, there are four things that matter to be successful. The first one is all around a data first alignment. Everything that you hear from vendors that have AI, it is all predicated on how good the data is that feeds these models. If the data is not good, the likelihood is you will not get the right insights, they will not drive the right actions, and those actions won't drive the right outcomes. And if, if we guide our sellers to actions that don't drive the right outcomes, they will immediately lose confidence in either the system or the leadership. So data first alignment matters. The second is, and this is a big one, and you're gonna see this today in what Ellie and Frank are going to show you. We are maniacally focused on building for the user because what Seth will tell you is that the leading vendor in the space must be building a platform that creates a single place for all of our sellers to work. So I don't care if you're a BDR, an AE, an AM, a CSM, pre-sales, post-sales, whatever nomenclature you use in the industry that you serve, if your daily remit is engaging with prospects and customers, you need to have a single place that you can get your work done. Rather than swivel chairing to a bunch of different applications, a bunch of different systems, and a bunch of different analytics that are conflicting that come from those systems. Now, the third one is sales and marketing alignment. And the reason why this is really important is because we are all both generating and consuming signals all day long. And if our marketing organizations and our selling organizations are looking at different signals, or even worse, looking at the same signals, but having different interpretations of them, we are gonna drive a very weird buying cycle for that prospect. Because they will hear one thing from your marketing org, and they will hear a totally different thing from your selling org. And that creates a lot of confusion and very rarely leads to a successful outcome. Now the last piece of it is we have to make use of AI. So you heard Sarah earlier talk about the power of AI, both in reducing administrative overhead for customer facing employees, but also increasing the value of the interactions when they are with the prospect and the customer. AI can make us smarter in the moment. And that's really important. So remember those four things as you think about your journey in revenue orchestration. The data first alignment, a single place to, for all of your customer facing employees to work, that alignment between sales and marketing, 
which also will extend to the buyer-seller alignment. We'll talk about that. And then making use of AI. So when we look at this slide, we have to remember that first and foremost, if we want to have a competitive advantage in our marketplace, we have to get to those buyers before our competition does. And we have to get to them with the right context to engage them in a way that drives both value for them and starts to initiate trust. So here's a second stat that's pretty scary, 97%. This is another stat by analysts, and this is 97% of sales leaders do not believe that the analytics that their sales tech stack generates actually drives an improvement, an improvement in seller performance. So think about all the money that we have all spent, all of the apps that we have to log into, all of the passwords that we forget that we have to reset every day. All of these analytics are conflicting and they don't actually drive an improvement in seller performance. So it does beg the question, with stats like this, where do we find optimism? We have seen, over the course of the last 25 years, three massive tectonic shifts that have created huge opportunity. And for the early adopters that took advantage of this opportunity, they created multi-generational companies that were market leaders in their space. Salesforce is one example of that. Tesla is an example of that. Workday is an example of that. Apple, if you think about what Apple has done since 2000, it's been an incredible Right, but all of these tectonic shifts create opportunity. That first one in the early 2000s with cloud. So for those of you that might have been around back then, I know it feels like a very, very long time ago, but for those of you that were around back then, you will remember the early adopters of cloud could simply pivot faster. They were able to drive synchronicity between their processes and their systems, and they could just execute faster than their competition that was still big iron on premise. The second one was around this concept of consumerization of IT. So we all have these like great consumer apps that we love. And we started to see that paradigm bleed into our professional lives. We all used Facebook extensively back in those early days. And then all of a sudden we saw technologies like Yammer and Slack that felt very much like how we communicate and collaborate on things like Facebook in our personal lives, but now we started to do it in our professional lives. If you think about the fact that we all live today in apps like this in our business, and there used to be a time where it was exclusively email to communicate. So think about how fast your organizations can collaborate and get to the right answer with nimble technologies like this. And now think about when mobile was added on top of this consumerization of IT. Now, all of a sudden, and you can see it today with products like Zoom, we now have in our pocket the ability in two clicks to be on a work call face-to-face -face with anybody in our network. We can now communicate and collaborate, and now we have AI. And while AI has been around for a long time, we've had it in our platform for a long time, the accessibility of it and the purpose-built nature of it allows us to have a huge unlock because now we can think of this new chain that is signals. And those signals, if you weigh them appropriately through your AI platform, you can generate insights. Insights are not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation of signals. So if I see a prospect is out on a site like G2 looking at information, that in and of itself might not be a powerful enough signal for me to create an insight and then an action. So how I weigh these signals and how I bring them together, aggregate them to create these insights, then afford me through leveraging workflow to create an action. And if that action correlates to a material outcome, either moving the deal forward, growing the deal, establishing more trust, or even closing a transaction, now all of a sudden, all of our sellers, all of our customer-facing employees trust the system. And when they start to trust the system, we can now see some commonality in behaviors. And the power of seeing commonality in behaviors allows us to understand what we can optimize. Do we optimize enablement? We saw earlier, Sarah told us enablement drives better performance. Is it messaging? 
Is it, do we have the wrong people? Do we have the wrong systems? Do we need to improve any of these? But it guides us. So when we make these changes, we get to see optimization happen at scale. And the most important thing about this, and this is why we just acquired Drift, is because if we are all building revenue orchestration platforms, and the end goal is to drive great outcomes, and we're gonna get to outcomes consistently by guiding our sellers to the best actions, and those actions come from insights that are generated out of signals, by being able to understand where your buyers are at before they even engage, before they even go in market, now allows us the power of deeply aligning a buyer journey and a seller journey. And for so long, without the science that we're talking about today, a buyer's journey looked totally different from a seller's journey. And now we can fundamentally change this. So not only can we all establish trust with our prospects faster, we can get them to a point of a transaction faster, but we can also guide them to successful deployment and referenceability faster. And I fundamentally believe that the companies that build the strongest customer armies will win. It's just that simple. If you have happy customers and they all have consistent experiences with you, they stay with you longer and they buy more and you build a deeper moat around them so your competition can never get in. So what does this all mean in action? So let's see here, there we go. So as we build our revenue orchestration platform, we think through the lens of the personas that we serve. This is a big departure from how some other companies build. We do not believe that we have all the answers and we will build a system and everyone will adopt it. What we believe is that we have to sit alongside our customers and every persona to understand what their day-to-day -day life looks like and what are the use cases that matter most to them. And we have to build specifically to make the execution of those use cases easier, more predictable, and more repeatable. Now, when we deeply understand the persona and the use case, we can actually determine through these signals and insights like we're talking about, actions in the workflow and we can guide them. So imagine you are in an opportunity now, pre-sales or post-sales, it doesn't matter. And the system tells you of every deal your company has ever done that looked like this, these were the most important actions that were taken to drive the best outcomes. And now you can guide the sellers to these. This is not a system that is gonna override what people do and create a bunch of robots that just like punch buttons when we're told to. But what this means is it can make this a little bit easier for us by anticipating what those buyers need and being able to take the in-house best practices and the industry best practices that we have learned from doing hundreds of millions of workflows every single year across 6,000 customers. And we can bring all of that power of knowledge to the seller at every single point that they interact with prospects and customers. And if we can do this, we unlock what I think is the holy grail in go-to-market organizations, which is as you scale to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of customer-facing employees, how do you get consistency and how do you get repeatability? How do you make sure that it's not just the top 10% of your sales org that hits their number? How can you take that middle cohort that does 70 to 80 to 90% and how can you bring them above that 100% threshold? Because when you do that, our worlds fundamentally change. The opacity that comes from all of the spend we allocate to go to market organizations, we now understand the return that we can get. And now we can be much more efficient with our capital, we can scale a lot faster. And when we scale a lot faster, we start to outperform the competition. So what does this actually look like? So for us, all of this is predicated on the fact that workflow is the foundation. There are so many different modalities with which we engage with prospects and customers. 
It was a lot easier in COVID because we we're all locked in our basements. We we're all doing this over Zoom and email and phone. You can record all of this. You can listen to it. You can derive insights from it. And those work. But now we are out of this pandemic. And, and there is a modality that we are all getting back to and we're all experiencing today, which is the face-to-face -face interactions. And right now, face-to-face -face interactions might only be a subset of what Zoom interactions are and email interactions and text and WhatsApp and all of that. But at the end of the day, people buy from people. And the bigger the deals you are working on, the more is at stake for the buyer as well as the seller. And trust happens through face-to-face -face interactions. Big unlocks in terms of learning about the, pro the prospect and, learn and the prospect learning about the vendor happens in these face-to-face -face moments. And so how do you capture those? Well, you capture them through workflow. Now, once you have workflow is that foundation, AI can really start to kick in. AI can kick in by listening to conversations if you don't tether people to workflow, but think about how that might work at scale. If I have 30,000, 10,000, 5,000, even 1,000 customer-facing employees, if they're all following their art and there's no commonality in their execution behaviors, it's really hard for the system to aggregate and learn and optimize at scale. Now, what this does not mean is that all of us, whether we have two months of selling experience or 20 years, we don't all do it the exact same way. But having a system that you can log in at any time of the day, and it'll tell you, Mark, here are the 10 most important things for you to do right now across your entire book of business. Here's why they're important. Here's whom you should do it for. Here's what to do. Here's the content to use. Here's when to do it. Might be a, a time sensitive thing. And here's the coaching of how to do it. We can now deliver all of this in the workflow through the power of AI. Now, we started originally as a company building for top of the funnel. If you've been with SalesLoft a long time, you probably started with basic workflow cadences to your BDRs and SDRs. But for revenue orchestration platforms to actually work at scale, they have to mirror our CRMs. They have to cover everything from pipeline all the way through renewal. So we have to be able to see AI drive these insights, not just for BDRs or AEs or whatever nomenclature you use for the person that carries the quota, but this, this has to work through the continuum of the entire buyer journey. Now, what you'll see this afternoon from Ellie and Frank is the next iteration on that, which is deeply role-based revenue orchestration. So whether you are an IC, a RevOps leader, a CRO, a CEO, a CFO, you should be able to have the system not only guide you to those next best actions that drive the outcomes, but you should be able to see an aggregate over time how these revenue outcomes have fundamentally changed your business and driven value both back to you as well as to the customers that you serve. And so what this looks like, and you can see the stats here on the right, these outcomes, these are real outcomes. These are outcomes that our customers today are seen on the platform. And these are outcomes that are happening in a pretty tough selling environment. High interest rates, a lot of uncertainty, people holding their budget very, very close to their vest. But these are the outcomes that we see. And as we talked about earlier, there is a moment right now, in the next two to three years, I do believe that almost all companies, just like almost all companies have a CRM, I believe almost all companies will have a form of a revenue orchestration platform. But for those that get to it first and can build the muscle internally around how to take advantage of it, you will simply outperform those in your space that do not do this. This will bring together the data. This will bring together buyers and sellers, sales and marketing. It will give you one place to work. All of this, insights to actions, to outcomes, the follow-up, the Gen AI that reduces administrative overhead for you, the coaching that guides you to be able to optimize those interactions in the moment with your prospects and sellers, all of you as early adopters will be able to take advantage of, and your competition that doesn't will be left behind. So, 
Let's hear a little bit from customers around this. So in this example, we actually hear from an AE, an account manager. And this is all around workflow. Cadence, which is workflow, is prospecting. Rhythm, which is our platform that's out since June of last year, is about making money. This was all about how the workflow powers AI and gives you those next, next best actions. But now let's look at a RevOps leader. SalesLoft is so much more than just sales engagements. That's the tip of the iceberg. So what's this all about? This is about orchestration. This is about the RevOps leader being able to get that consistency and behavior that generates the insights for that individual and team to know how to optimize the machine around your sellers to be able to drive the best outcomes. And then you hear from a senior leader at IBM, you have to be able to stay on top of thousands of client interests that are coming in. And SalesLoft is the differentiator in the space. So IBM, who's been a customer of ours for almost six years and is now in the process of deploying this to 40,000 users in 30 plus countries, this is all about scale. So when all of this comes together, it validates why workflow is so important as the foundation of these orchestration platforms. Because if you get it, it will guide your sellers to better actions and they will make more money and they will hit their quota with more consistency and repeatability. Your RevOps leaders will get the insight as to how to optimize the machine in real time. Not at the end of the year, not at the end of the quarter, but incrementally every day to the benefit of not just the sellers, but the buyers. All of these changes now, because we can bring art and science together, all of these changes improve the lives, not just of your employees, but of the customers you serve. It's why it's so important, because it now aligns us in a way we've never been able to align before. And then when you think about scale, the ability now to be able to guide a large organization with, with a nimbleness that we often see in much smaller organizations. So it's been a very hard thing to do with tech. And this is a huge unlock. So with that, we are very focused and committed to powering your teams with these actionable insights, not only to hit your revenue targets, but to do it every day. We believe the big unlock that we will all experience here in the next couple of years, and while it doesn't sound super sexy, consistency and repeatability in how we scale our organizations changes everything. If you think about how hard it's been to predict the next quarter and the next year in COVID and in rising interest rates and global challenges that we're all facing, but when we can tether our organizations, especially our customer orgs, to a set of behaviors that we know have a very high level of confidence to drive great outcomes, our lives just get a little bit easier. And more importantly, we establish another degree of trust with our customers that allows us to look very differently at the lifetime value we get from them and the value that they get from their investment in your platform.